Well, hey everybody. Um, apparently, I am the physical version of Tinder because my goal and my ministry is literally about bringing online and on-site church together. That's what I've been doing uh, since 2008. Um, and so now, yeah, I, I just, Liquid, thank you for giving me that honor of feeling like Tinder. Never thought that would happen. <laughs> Might be the weirdest sentence I say today. Um, <laughs> hey, there are two things that I know about you. I'm not from the US, I'm from Australia, but I already know two things about you. And I don't know your ministry context at all, but I definitely know two things about you. And the fact that you've made time out of your week to be at a conference like this that is all about helping you take a step into the future of the church tells me that these two things are true. And the first thing I know about you is that you want to reach more people in your local community so that you can change more lives, right? You want to reach more people in your local community specifically so that you can change more lives. And the second thing that I know about you is that by now, you've already realized that digital ministry is more complicated, more time-consuming, and more overwhelming than you could ever have imagined. And that's why in this session, what I want to do is give you some ways of thinking to help make it easier for you to connect with more people in your local context and to think more innovatively in a meta world. Now, just to reintroduce myself just a little bit, as you've already heard, my name is Dave, and about 18 months ago, I returned back home to Australia with my wife and three daughters after spending 13 or 14 years in full-time ministry in the U.S. As Pastor Tim has already said, I moved to the U.S. in 2008 when I started, right, started working right here in Liquid Church. Uh, when Tim had this crazy idea to fly me over and my family so that I could start an online campus. So I moved to New Jersey and became the eighth online pastor in the world. Then in 2013, uh, my family packed up and we moved down to Atlanta so I could become the social media pastor at North Point where Andy Stanley is the lead pastor. And for all of the seven years that I was at North Point, our church was consistently in the top three largest churches in the U.S. with more than 42,000 people in physical attendance every week pre-COVID. Now, my role at North Point was to pastor the people who connected with our church digitally. And this meant through social media, podcasts, and YouTube. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like at a church like North Point, we had... 900,000 people per month who downloaded our podcast, 80,000 people who watched our message video on demand from our website, 70,000 people per week who live streamed the online services that I was hosting. We had about 250,000 people who watched our content on YouTube. And if you calculate all of our six Atlanta area campuses, we had over a million people following us on social media. Now, I loved what I got to do at North Point. Absolutely loved it, but it was so overwhelming. I remember after my first week in the job, I came home uh, on Thursday night, because I work Sunday to Thursday, and I came home Thursday night and my wife said to me, hey babe, how's the new job going? Do you love it? How is it, like tell me everything. And I said, you know what? I kind of feel like a mosquito in a nudist colony. See, I know exactly what I need to do, but I don't know where to start. And she said to me, please don't ever share that publicly. And I said, I will never do that. Why would I? That's stupid. So luckily, she's on the other side of the world in Australia right now. This isn't being live streamed, right? I'll be good. I'll be good. Um, I loved what I got to do, I loved being a pastor, but I wasn't always a pastor. In fact, growing up, the only thing I wanted to be in the whole world was to be a sports reporter. And so I went to college and I studied and I got a journalism degree in Melbourne, Australia, and then I started working for local newspapers and I went, eventually went on to work for a, a national magazine and I became the youngest ever editor of Australia's highest selling sports magazine. Straight after that, one of the three major networks in Australia called me and said, we'd love for you to come and be a sports reporter. And for the next seven years, I was a sports reporter for 
essentially our version of ESPN Sports Center. Now, I know some of you, I can feel it, some of you are looking at me going, that guy doesn't look like a sports reporter. <laughs> so here's a photo of me to prove it. This is what I look like in my reporter days. <laughs> Wait, why did you all laugh? <laughs> wow, that's so awkward. Why did you laugh at that? You just made it awkward for me now. Back then, man, I was like thin. <laughs> I was clean cut, I had to wear a shirt and tie to work every single day. And then I moved to America for 14 years and... <laughs> Thanks a lot, America. <laughs> Making Dave great again. <laughs> well, only half the room laughed. So why is... Uh, <laughs> why is innovation important? Why is innovation important, especially in a church context. Well, at its core, innovation is about problem solving. And we all know that in the postmodern, post-Christian church, we have, we have a problem. I mean, all the data shows that around the world, people have become increasingly indifferent to church. All the data since the 90s shows that every year more people stop attending church, and that includes people who say they follow Jesus. It seems like every year we get confirmation that the church has become irrelevant. Now, I think part of the reason for this is that too many, for too many churches, we've built a model based on this flawed definition of what it means to be relevant, and, and we confuse the idea of relevance with smoke machines and flashy lights and, and, and cool music and skinny jeans and, and deep v-neck t-shirts on worship pastors. But that's not what relevance really is. As my mate Kerry Newhoff says, just because the gospel is always relevant doesn't mean you are. Just because the gospel is always relevant, it doesn't mean that you are. Being relevant isn't about cool music and smoke machines and hipster glasses. It's about meeting people's needs in the moment that they need it. For example, if I was stranded in the middle of the desert for a week, no food, no water, no shelter, and Pastor Tim arrived, I saw some smoke, you know, some dust cloud over on the horizon, and Pastor Tim showed up in a car, got out, gave me a bottle of water, he is the most relevant person in the world to me in that moment because he's meeting my need in the moment that I need it. I, I, I don't care what sort of car he drives. I don't care what brand of water he gives me. He is the most relevant person in the world to me. That is what relevance is. It's not about smoke machines and lights and music. It's about meeting the needs of the people in your local community, Me meeting the needs of the people who live within driving distance of your building. But in my experience as an online and social media pastor at one of the largest churches in the US, I think the main reason the church has become ir irrelevant is because we've stopped innovating. In fact, I would go as far to say that the church has a fear of innovation. The church has a fear of innovation. And that's because the, the exercise of innovation requires us to take a risk, right? It requires a risk, it requires sacrifice, it requires a commitment to something that is not guaranteed to work. And I believe that this scares a lot of church leaders. And that's why churches will usually make hiring decisions based on people who are cultural fits, who share the same values, who share the same vision. And that seems right, right? It seems like the right answer. But what this means, what it leads to, is we end up just hiring people who think and look exactly the same as us, not people who think differently, who push us to think differently and to innovate. So we just keep doing things as we've always done them because no one is challenging us to think differently. And we do this, we, have, we are averse to this risk because there's too much on the line financially and spiritually and missionally to risk failure, right? We've got this great vision and mission and calling, and we don't want to risk that. And that becomes even more of a risk if we've already had some success, if we've already built a large building, if we've already drawn crowds, we're even less likely 
to innovate because we're less likely to take that risk. If we think of church, recent church history, as a bell curve, in the 90s, the church was in a season of success right around the world, it seemed like. There was, and, that, and that was when this attractional, modern music, smoke machine, light show style of church was really in full swing. And, and I'm not, please hear me on this, I'm not being negative about that. That was when I became a Christian, was during that period of time. And churches like Hillsong really led the way in that. And we saw the immense success that Hillsong had. And as a result, we all wanted to replicate that. We didn't want to innovate our own thing. We said, let's take something that's already working, because in a lot of ways, <laughs> churches are proof of concept organizations. If we can prove that something has worked, we'll just steal it. And that's okay. I'm not, again, not ragging on that. But, but if we stole something from the 90s and we're still replicating it today, we're not relevant and we are not innovative. But we instinctively choose to stick to these models because that brought us success in the past, right? And the truth is, that grew a lot of churches 30 years ago. And that makes it even more likely that we're going to stick to that safe option model. But the data shows it's not working anymore. Gallup research from 20, uh, 2008 showed that church attendance had taken a sharp decline. And the decade-long downward slide of in-person worship attendance continued, and it even accelerated until recent years. Now, in any organization, leaders assume that innovation happens at the top of the growth bell curve, right? That's where we assume innovation is going to happen. But this is when changing our model is the most risky, because we're at the height of our success and failure means we go into free fall, fall. So if we have success, we're less likely to innovate because it's more of a risk because the drop is even higher. And that's why in normal circumstances, and you're all smart leaders, I know that you know this, you, like you're already ahead of me on this, I know that you know that in normal circumstances, what we do, if we want to innovate successfully, it's on the upward climb of the bell curve. Any innovation here is likely to propel an organization to even greater heights than they were set out for because we've innovated something new, we've come up with a new model, and we go to an all-new height, and the bell curve continues to grow up, and we don't ever get to that peak. Now, there are some cases where innovation at the top of the bell curve can kick off some new growth, but this is very rare. It's a very unique situation of maybe a very unique organization that is able to kick off new growth at the top of the bell curve. Or there's some huge external influence on the organization that allows this to become a possibility. A huge external influence like, I don't know, maybe a global pandemic? And this is where I believe the church finds itself today and why I believe the church needs to be more innovative than ever before. Not just because of COVID-19 in the world, but because of indifference in the world. We have to be more innovative than ever before because of the high level of indifference in the community around us. Especially when it comes to spiritual things, especially when it comes to the organization of church. You see, even before COVID hit, more people were attending church less or not attending church at all. In 2019, Pew Research showed that in the US, 32% of Gen X Christians attended church services every week. 22% of millennial Christians attended church every week. In that same year, 2019, Barna Research indicated that 29% of people in any age group who identified as church attenders attended church weekly, only, I mean, only 29%. These are people who identified as Christians, right? These are people who are on our side, they're on our team. And only 29% of them are saying, I'm gonna come up every single week. Again, you all know this, but the reality is that even people who attend church stopped attending church. But before you get too depressed, consider this. Barna research from that same time showed that 38% of practicing Christians use social media to grow their faith. Now, I know some of you might be thinking right now, wait, I don't know if I'm happy about that. I don't know if that's a good thing. Well, consider this. That's exactly the same number. 38% of 
practicing Christians, who say that they read Christian books to help grow themselves spiritually, to help be part of this uh, discipleship plan. That same number. And we're all okay with that, right? Nobody's saying, hey, you know what, church, stop reading Tim Keller books. You know what, church, don't read any more Andy Stanley, don't read any more Craig Rochelle. No, we say read more books. But when it comes to social media, when that stat's in there, we're iffy. Hmm, not sure how I feel. At the same time, the research showed that 26% of Christians accessed a sermon or message podcast every single week, and 26% watched or listened to a streamed church service. See, innovation with technology has been the thing keeping church connected for the past three years. And that's why now is not the time for us to go back to how we've always done it, but instead to make an honest assessment of where we need to go next. We need to ask questions about why church attendance has been in free fall for years, about how we can continue to connect with people who are already, already connected digitally. There's a whole generation of people who have not known life without smartphones. How are we going to connect with them? Now is the time, I believe, for every church leader to be absolutely, unapologetically, unwavering in your mission while experimenting with your model. Now is time for us to be asking questions about our church model, our church attendance, our church resources, our church's ability to reach people in our local community. Because when you look back at the early church, this is exactly what they did at the Council of Jerusalem a few years after Jesus' death. You know, all, you know this story, all the church leaders get together to ask questions about their model, and during that meeting, which is recorded in Acts chapter 15, if you're following along at home, James, the brother of Jesus, which is a pretty cool title, I think, what would, it take, <laughs> what would it take for you to believe your older brother was the Messiah? <laughs> death and resurrection, maybe? So James is at this meeting and he stands up and he declares, we should not make it difficult for people who are turning to God. We should not make it difficult for people, and he's talking specifically about Gentiles here, so people who are unchurched, we should not make it difficult for unchurched people who are turning to God. But unfortunately, the church is once again making it difficult for people who are turning to God. And, and we are. Studies show that COVID lockdowns, here's the interesting thing, people are turning towards God. People are seeking a little bit more. COVID has stirred something up in the community and studies prove this. Studies have shown that one in three people, 33%, admit that they were more likely to engage in spiritual conversations now post COVID. 41% of people are thinking more about God, and 53% are thinking more about their own mortality. 55% of people are asking more questions about the meaning of life. These are spiritual questions. These are questions where we can come in with answers that can actually lead people to a whole new life. Amen? I know we all believe this. People are asking these questions, but are we making it easy for them? While unchurched people are asking questions about faith and about God and about Jesus and about the Bible and about worship and about the church, I don't think church leaders are asking enough questions. We need to be asking questions about our model, not for the sake of church attendance, but for the sake of the next generation. My old boss, Andy Stanley, puts it this way with this question, what is the faith of the next generation worth? Write that down and think about that for just a moment. What is the faith of the next generation worth? What is it worth to your church? But more specifically, what, it's, what is it worth to you? What is the faith of the next generation worth? I believe it's worth us rethinking our models, reimagining our ideas of discipleship and ministry and rewriting our traditions. Now notice, I didn't say abandon any of those things. I didn't say replace any of those things. And that's because I've never met an online pastor, myself included, 
who believes that online church should replace on-site church. Let me say that again for all the lead pastors in the room. I have never met an online pastor, myself included, who believes that online church should or could replace on-site church. In fact, every online pastor I know, again, myself included, sees church online as a way to enhance physical church, not replace it. But rethinking and reimagining requires us to ask questions about ourselves and about our model, something we're not really known for in the church, right? It's not like people are, those church people are always reinventing themselves. Those church people are always asking really difficult questions about leadership, about their organization. No, that's not what our reputation is. And I think one of the biggest questions that we have to ask ourselves is how do we define and measure success in the church? How do we define our success in a post-Christian, post-modern, post-COVID digital world? How do we define that? You see, for decades, we've defined our success by full parking lots and full pews on Sunday. The more people we see in front of us, the more successful we think we are because we've always assumed that bigger is better. And we usually justify these feelings. We, we, we make it spiritual by quoting Hebrews 10.25. And let us not neglect meeting together. But the truth is that unfortunately, we often measure our success and, this is important, and determine our self-worth by how many people are in the room listening to us preach or teach or sing or do an altar call. Let me restate that. I think too often we take that verse and we use it to spiritualize something that's going on in us that is not healthy. That we are measuring our own self-worth, not because of what Christ has done, but by how many people are standing in front of us listening while we preach. And it's why we, as pastors, will often post things on social media, like I'm so blessed that 7,452 people showed up today. So honored to be part of what God is doing as 14,000 people walk to the front. Like, it's why we post things on Saturday or Friday, pre-church Sunday, telling people that this Sunday service will be the best service ever. You will lose weight, your marriage will be better, you'll grow your hair back, you'll get out of financial strife. Just show up to church. Like we do... Have you checked any of the analytics around whether or not that actually works? I might, no, I would say it doesn't. (laughs) But we do it because we want as many people to come as possible. We think that we've got the best burger stand in the community and we want everybody to taste it. We need to stop and ask ourselves why, how are we measuring our own self-worth and are we making the church numbers a priority because it's impacting us emotionally? If you go home and eat a whole sleeve of Oreos on a Sunday night because only half the people in church showed up, there might be an issue. We let, this, we let these things influence our thoughts and our opinions about innovation and digital ministry. We let this draw a line in the sand between online and on-site church. And on-site church always wins. But if Paul had thought like most modern day pastors in this way, that the only way to teach somebody and disciple people was in physical, face-to-face community, then at least 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament wouldn't have been written. Fortunately for us, Paul embraced the technology of his day and used it to expand his reach beyond his physical location. The technology of Paul's day was letter writing, right? And he used it effectively to reach people who are far away from him and far away from God. For the people who are under 30, letter writing is when you take a pen and you press it onto paper (laughs) and then you move your wrist around to create words. It's called letter writing. But the problem that I see in the church today is that that the church, capital C Church, has lost Paul's innovative spirit. When COVID hit and our church buildings closed, the Sunday live stream became mainstream. 
But when our buildings reopened, we treated online church like it was a short-term mission trip. We went on back, you know, when, when things were like that. But now we're back in the real world. And so when our buildings reopened and we stepped back into the church building, we also stepped back into time. And the downward slide in church attendance not only continued, but based on the most recent data, it actually accelerated. If we're going to reverse this trend, then we need to start thinking meta. This is a concept I unpack in my book, which Tim already plugged. Um, it's called Meta Church, which is not a book about having church in the metaverse, okay? It's not about that. See, the word meta is a prefix, and it's a prefix that can mean a number of different things. It can mean to transform, as in the word metamorphosis, or it can mean to go beyond or be more comprehensive, as in the word metaphysical, which means to go beyond the physical. So when I used this prefix and attached it to the word church to create this word meta church, I'm describing an expression of the church that has been transformed to go beyond the church building and to go beyond a Sunday time slot. Meta church is an expression of church that gives validity to everyday faith experiences, whether they happen on site or online, on Sunday or throughout the week, not just those that happen specifically in a designated building at a designated time. A meta church approach understands that in this postmodern, post Christian world that we live in, the front door of the church is in people's pockets. The front door of the church is in people's pockets. A meta church approach takes the emphasis of connecting with people for just one hour on a Sunday to create opportunities for church leaders to stay connected for the other 167 hours of the week. And they do that online. A meta church approach to ministry leverages digital platforms like YouTube Shorts, like TikTok, like Instagram, like podcasts, like Twitch, like WhatsApp, like emails and integrates them into a discipleship strategy. It takes the best of online and combines it with the best of on-site. And then it tracks and it measures people's engagement with the church, not just their attendance at the church. I mean, sure, it would be so much easier for us to simply keep doing church the way we've always done it, right? That's, that would be easy, just bury your head in the sand just do it the way we've always done it, it would be so much easier. But the truth is, if you want to make a difference in the world, you have to be different from the world. If you want to make a difference in the world, which I believe everybody here does, you want to make a difference in your local communities, you want to make a difference in your local schools, you want to make a difference in your local businesses, you want to impact the people who live, the families that live within driving distance of your building, I believe you want to make a difference in the world, but in order to do that, we have to be different from the world. And an innovative church, man, that's just different. It's different to what the world expects because they expect us to just keep on doing on what we've always done, right? Church doesn't innovate. Apple innovates. Tesla innovates. Church doesn't innovate. What if our reputation changed? That, those church people, man, <laughs> I don't agree with what they say about this Jesus fella, but they are the most innovative people in the world. The way that they innovate and leverage technology to reach and impact my family and solve some of my personal issues, man, that church down the road, I think it's weird how they sing and put their hands up in the air on Sundays, but all of their social media posts have helped make my life better and make me better at life. Could you imagine? But that requires us to innovate. So I feel like, because I'm trying to read the room, I feel like I fire-hosed you all. Think that's an American term? I know it is, I've lived here for a long time. Um, <laughs> I feel like I fire-hosed you all, like I gave you, like. There's so much more we could unpack and we could get into detail. And I've got a breakout coming up, but here's what I wanted to do. I believe so strongly in this stuff. I believe so strongly in the church. I believe we have an opportunity that is unprecedented. You know, every 500 years or so, 
the church goes through a reformation, the church goes through a change, and we're at that pinnacle point right now, and it's because of technology. And COVID just enhanced that and, and quickened it. And I believe so strongly in this idea that we need to um, embrace what's happening digitally and use it to contextualize our, our mission into the local community, whatever community God has called you to serve in, that I don't think a, a, a a 30-minute talk like this is enough. So what I want to do, I believe in this so much, I want to give you access to my cell phone, my email, and I want to help you. I just want to answer your questions. I'm not getting anything. I'm not putting out a, like I'm not putting you on a MailChimp list or anything like that, but the easiest way to do it is if you scan this QR code, you will get all of my details. You will get my phone number. My, my personal cell phone, if you've got a... Uh, if you've got an iPhone, you can text me for free. If you've got some other phone, we're going to pray for you later on. <laughs> um, but this is literally all of my contact details. And I want to do that because, man, I just believe in the church so much. I had this such a rough childhood before Jesus, and I know the impact that connecting with Jesus can have, that I want to help churches reach a generation who need Jesus as badly as I did when I was 17. And so I just want to answer any questions that you have. I want to help in any way that I can support you. People text me all the time and say, hey, what platform should my church be on? I, that's what I want to do. I, want to, I, just want, I seriously just want to help. And so it's so ridiculous of me to give out my private details, but this is legit. This is me. Like, this is my stuff. I'm not, there's nobody else going to respond. It's, it's, it's my phone. If you text me right now, it's probably buzzing right now backstage. That's why I don't bring it out anymore. But that's because I believe in the church so much. I believe in, in this idea of integrating technology to make online and on-site better. And you know what? I'm not from the Northeast, but I lived here for nearly six years. And Pastor Tim will tell you this if you talk to him privately. He'll tell you this. When I moved here... I felt such a connection in so many ways, the people of New Jersey, the people of Pennsylvania, the pe people are texting me. My watch is buzzing. Um, <laughs> people of New Jersey, I felt so home, at home here that it is like, it's like coming home. I've been in New Jersey long enough to eat bacon and eggs at a diner at 2 a.m., to have disco fries, <laughs> to have seen Bon Jovi's last concert at Giant Stadium and to have scalped tickets to a Bruce Springsteen concert with Pastor Tim in, New in Newark. <laughs> it's a whole other story. Tim, do you remember that? Um, but no, I believe in this. And so as church leaders in the, in, in the Northeast, you, you guys are serving what I feel like is my second home. And so I want to be here to support you in any way that I can. So feel free to use that however you want to do it. I want to pray for you all. And then, uh, then Kyla and uh, Kyra are going to come back out. Father God, I just thank you that you, for whatever reason, have given us this unique opportunity at a time in history when we can literally go into all the world in a second. You have chosen us and this generation to make an impact. So God, would you give us an innovative spirit? Would you give us a spirit that reminds us continually that your son sometimes preached on steps, sometimes preached in the field, sometimes preached on a boat. He changed the model, but he never changed the mission, and he never changed the message. So God, would you help us to think innovatively? Would you put a stir up in us a spirit of innovation? Innovation, God, to take a first century message into a 21st century world. And would you help us do that especially in the local communities that you have called us to serve in. And we pray this in the amazing, healing, holy, powerful, innovative name of Jesus. And everybody agreed and said, amen. amen. Thanks for watching the Liquid Church YouTube channel. Hey, don't stop here. I want to invite you to be part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this with a friend. You know, everybody's welcome to join us. If you are blessed by this message, you can support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. Thanks so much for watching. God bless.